Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hey, since we're celebrating Epiphany, the day of light, I thought I'd start out with some light jokes. Here's three of them. First joke. I want you to imagine the cartoon of a light bulb laying on a psychiatrist's couch with the psychiatrist there. Got it? Got that picture? Well, get this. The light bulb tells the doctor, well, doc, my brother, my brother was always the bright one. And he adds, I felt rather dim by comparison. Okay. Second joke. We got two to go. How many politicians does it take to change a light bulb? The answer, two. One to change it and the other to change it back later. <laughs> Third joke, last joke. What did the light bulb say to the generator? I really get a charge out of you. Oh well. Makes you wonder how Diane can take it for so long, doesn't it? I guess she hasn't seen the light yet. Speaking of seeing the light, the wise men in our gospel today famously saw the light, the star, and kept on following it. They followed it for many, many, many miles. You know, we don't know how many wise men there actually were. Matthew doesn't tell us. Yes, there were three gifts, but there could have been anywhere from two to 2,000 magi giving those three gifts. Probably closer to ten than two wise men because of the text. You see, Matthew writes that the wise men opened their treasure chests. Now, you don't need several treasure chests to carry a little bit of gold or frankincense like I have in my hand here. A little bit of that. Or a little bit of myrrh in my hand here. You don't even need one chest for that. So having several treasure chests probably means several people, an entourage. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Because before they got to Bethlehem, these men stopped to talk to King Herod in Jerusalem first. You've heard of King Herod, haven't you? Sometimes called Herod the Great. The Great, not because he did good things for his people, but rather because he did impressive things. Herod welcomed them into his palace. An extremely intelligent man. One expert has called him an evil genius. Herod had ambitiously taken over the throne of Israel. His father wasn't the king. But over 30 years, it put Herod in a very precarious position. It was precarious because Herod had to position himself between, on the one hand, the mighty Roman Empire that backed him up. And on the other hand, his people, who hated those Romans and wanted a purely religious anti-pagan nation. So Herod placated both sides. For instance, he greatly expanded and beautified the temple grounds, which pleased the people. But at the same time, he angered those people by also placing a statue of a Roman eagle at the entrance to that temple. Yes, Herod impressed the people by putting up other great buildings... But the millions he spent for those billings meant much higher taxes to be paid by the people. And being totally negative here, Herod had his spies who would catch suspects that Herod immediately executed. Herod even executed his uncle, one of his wives, her mother, and his three eldest sons. One of those sons was ex executed right at the time of Christ's birth. As pagan author Macrobius wrote, when it was heard that as part of the slaughter of boys up to two years old that Herod, king of the Jews, had also ordered his own son to be killed, the Roman August emperor Augustus heard about this and remarked with a laugh, my, it's better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Herod probably justified killing his relatives and doing other rotten things as a matter of self-preservation. And his rationalization that, that he was the only one who could really rule Israel. Great English author Dorothy Sayers once wrote a play in which the wise men talk with Herod. What sort of man, Herod asked them in this play, will this be that is born to be king of the Jews? And a wise man named Melchior responds that the Christ 
will be prouder than Caesar, yet more humble than Caesar's slave. His kingdom shall stretch from the sun's setting to the sun's rising, higher than the heavens and deeper than the grave. Herod responds, you speak mysteries to me. Tell me this, will he be a warrior king? And Balthasar speaks up, oh, the greatest of warriors, yet he shall be called the prince of peace. He will be both victor and victim in all his wars, and he will make his triumph in death, in defeat. And when wars are over, Balthazar concludes, this king will rule his people in love. Herod scoffs at that and gets serious. You cannot rule people by love. When you find your king, tell him so. Only three things will govern a people. Fear and greed and the promise of security. Do I know it? Herod suddenly shouts a question to them. Have I not loved? I have been a stern ruler, dreaded and hated, yet my country is prosperous with their borders at peace. But whenever I loved, I found treachery. Wife, children, brother, all of them, all of them. Love, Herod concludes. Love is a traitor. It has betrayed me. It has betrayed all kings. And it will betray your Christ. I will wager that from Herod's selfish point of view, Herod did feel betrayed by the family he executed. All dictators are much too quick to feel a betrayal. Sayers here, through her character of Herod, I think brilliantly reveals something about our own sinful flesh. That greatly fearful being, that sinful flesh that lives inside of us, inside of each of us, insecure and potentially violent. But Matthew informs us in his text that the real Herod played his cards differently with the Magi, differently from the play. Yes, Matthew writes, Herod was fearful, but he hid that fear with a great lie. He told the wise men that he too wanted to bow and pay homage to the newborn king. Fortunately, after seeing the babe, the wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And they left to their own country by another road, it says. We too, you and I, are called by God not to return to Herod, not to return to Herod's evil ways, and to leave for God's country, the kingdom of God of love, by another road, as Pastor Paul loved to say of that moment. First and foremost, that road of life goes down the path of love, uh, an unconditional love for others that, yes, sometimes leads to others betraying us, yes, Herod's right about that part. But the God who is love is betrayed by us all the time, and yet he still loves us. As God's children, we too are called, therefore, to keep on loving, to keep on serving others, to keep on, by partly turning the other cheek, to keep on filling the world with love until fear is drowned and the world cannot hate anymore. In Dorothy Sayers' play, recall that her character Melchior told Herod that Christ's kingdom shall stretch from the sun's setting to the sun's rising. Think about that. That's the opposite way from the way it's all usually described. We, we always say from the rising to the setting sun. Melchior was saying that Christ's kingdom rules in the night. Christ's kingdom rules in the dark. We automatically, all of us, know that God rules in the good times when, metaphorically speaking, the sun is shining and all is right with the world. But Sayers, a very devout Christian, was saying that Melchior, through Melchior, that Christ is also with us in the night times, the dark times of our lives, from sunset, from sunset to sunrise as well. That's true even in nature. At night, the moon is always with us, and from new moons to full moons and back, the moon reflects what? The light of the sun. So in that sense, the sun never sets. 
The sun, the S-U-N, like the son of God, S-O-N, is always there for us day and night through the moon. The son of God, likewise, is always lifting us up and carrying us through thick and thin. The son of God is always reflecting, like the moon, the light of God's wisdom and love into your hearts. Just when you need it most. In the darknesses of all of our lives. So you see, God is always at work in our lives. And the more we remember that, the more we see the light. The more we study the Bible and pray, the more, Paul says, the eyes of our hearts are enlightened by the Spirit, then the more we see and understand our mission in life. And then we become like the moon, too. And you and I are able to reflect in our loving actions the light of God directly into other people's darknesses. Arise, shine, for your light has come, Isaiah proclaims today, telling us that thanks to the grace of God, we shall see how to be Christ's heart, hands, and voice, and thus become radiant in God's eyes as we do so. Amazingly, a wonderful song related to the Magi that fits this theme was shared with me recently. One of its verses applies to the darkness of the challenges that we face nowadays, right? The verse addresses God like this. As the dark awaits the dawn, so we await your light, O star of promise. O star of promise, scatter night, loving bright, loving bright, till the shades of fear are gone. As the moon reflects the sun, Until the nights decrease, may we your healing light release. Living peace, living peace, until your holy dawn. God's holy dawn will indeed break over us. God's holy dawn through faith is actually already within us. My friends, today is Epiphany Sunday. The Greek word epiphany, epiphanos, means revelation, illumination. So may we continue to be illuminated by God, illuminated by prayer and listening to God's commands so that we may reflect, reflect in two ways. First, as we've been saying, let us reflect God's love from God right into the lives of the people who are hurting around us. Don't worry about your darkness. God's doing the same thing with other people into your darkness. Second reflection. Secondly, let us also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, daily reflect upon, reflect upon how we've lived in the past. Let us reflect in that way, too, so that we can love others even better than before and be even more little Christ to those around us. Let us give Christ the light that's already within us, an opportunity to shine out, to scatter every darkness. Let us give Christ the light within us, an opportunity to, to, by what we say and do, to shed his warm, loving light upon those around us, those around us who keep watching and keep waiting in the dimness for him, in the dimness of our present world. Amen.